Hi, I'm Jamie Batts, your instructor for AMP2. We are continuing on, I was going to say finishing, there's no way we're going to finish, um, our lecture on the digestive system. We just finished talking about some of the um, microscopic uh, and, um, I guess, details of the lining of our intestinal tract. So now we're going to dive in closer and look at exactly what our small intestine is made of. It's divided into the three segments, um, the duodenum or duodenum, depending on you know who you talk to, potato, potato, um, the jejunum, and the ileum. The small intestine is the main area of the digestive tract where the nutrients are absorbed. I don't know why this thing popped up. Sorry about that. So um, this, uh, sorry that like, it, it was the video that I just did that just like popped up for some reason. Anyways, 90% of the nu uh, nutrient absorption from our entire digestive tract happens here in the small intestine. The rest of it is occurring in the large intestine and, and it's a different composition um, that's being absorbed in the large intestine and the small intestine. It's roughly 20 feet long. Uh, which sounds crazy to think that there's something that long inside of you, but it's true. Um, and it's fairly narrow, so, you know, 1.6 inches or so, which is, again, why so much of it can fit in there. And, again, those three segments that I mentioned before. Of course, uh, the three segments are divided because they're all a little different in structure and function. Let's, oops, let's take a look at them here. You can see um, the where these things, where these sections are, I should say, in relative position to the um, regions of our abdominal pelvic cavity. So the duodenum is that blue structure. It's just like the first 10 inches or so. Then the jejunum, um, which is more superior. And then the ileum, which is the um, lower portion um, of our um, small intestine. And that uh, ileum is what segments into our large intestine and we'll look at all these structures as we go along. So let's talk about that duodenum, duodenum. I kind of switch back and forth between what I call it. Um, so it, it was called, my a &P instructor called it the duodenum, um, but then sometimes other a &P instructors that I've met since then call it the duodenum. Again, no big deal. 10 inches in length, as I said, it's pretty short. It's the close segment that's closest to the stomach. This is really um, the main mixing bowl of our small intestine. So not a whole lot of, of absorption happens in this section. Think about it. This chyme is being spurted, remember my ketchup bottle analogy, right? Just kind of squirting over out of that pyloric sphincter into the duodenum from the stomach, right? And remember, this chyme is coming over from the stomach. It's highly acidic. It is very mixed up and very watery from all of the gastric secretions. So as it comes over, one of the main jobs of the duodenum is to increase the pH and continue the digestion and, and breakdown of all of these nutrients. Because again, remember, we had some chemical digestion of carbohydrates and lipids in the mouth, a little bit of lipids and a lot of protein digestion in the stomach, now we need to make sure that we're continuing that chemical digestion process, breaking these chemical bonds in the nutrients so that they become small enough so that they can be absorbed by those villi. So um, that kind that's coming over, again, has to, has to continue to be broken down. Um, there's very few um, circular folds in this area, again, because the main job is not absorption in the duodenum. The main job is mixing and churning. There are duodenal glands that secrete mucus. The mucus is there to help neutralize the acidic chyme that's coming over from the stomach. The jejunum is between the duodenum and the ileum, and it makes a sharp bend at the beginning, and then it's, it's fairly long, eight, eight feet long or so. It's located in the peritoneal cavity, many folds, many long villi. This is the main site of absorption. So after all of the mixing and churning that takes place in the duodenum, right, all these enzymes are mixed in, and then this chyme continues via peristalsis to move through the small intestine. Remember, brush border enzymes along the way are continuing that breakdown of fats, proteins, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids. Um, all of those parts are being broken down and slowly through this jejunum 
they're being absorbed. So the majority of chemical digestion and absorption is occurring in the jejunum. How is the chemical digestion occurring from the brush border enzymes and segmentation? Remember that 30 second dance party, right? Peristalsis is moving along and then everyone stops. It's hammer time, jam it out, mix it up, then keep going, right? Brush border enzymes along the way are digesting some of the larger parts into smaller chemicals. Finally, the ileum, 11 feet long. This is the longest section. It ends at the ileocecal valve, uh, which is a small sphincter, um, and basically segueing from the, the small intestine to the large intestine. Um, much fewer circular folds than the jejunum, um, and the villi are relatively short. The submucosa has lots of lymphoid nodules there. Because um, at this point in the digestive process, you know, after this chyme has moved through, the majority of the nutrients have been absorbed. So what's left over is a lot of fat, the, which is harder to absorb, um, a lot of water, which hasn't really been absorbed yet, and then a lot of the undigestible material. So here you can see the actual difference between these structures, and you can see it in the um, cartoon picture in the center as well as in the actual cadaver pictures the difference between the folds and um, the overall structure. Notice all of the glands that are present in the duodenum and the lymph nodes that are present in the ileum. So you can pause the video here, go back and review this section. We're going to start talking about some of the hormones involved in digestion. We've alluded to them before, but we haven't actually named them yet. So four of them are actually produced by the duodenum. There's five major hormones total. Four of them are produced by that first section of the small intestine. So the, the duodenum is a major coordination center. Not only is it receiving all of the chyme from the stomach, it's sending it onto the jejunum for absorption. So it's a great kind of relay center between everything. The duodenum is also the site where the liver and pancreas make their secretions. So again, a good feedback area for um, those glands that are secreting into the digestive tract. So one of these hormones is gastrin. Gastrin is secreted by G cells, right? That's kind of how they got their name. Um, it's stimulated by the presence of food in the stomach as in the duodenum, and particularly food that has a high protein content. It increases the mobility and motion in the stomach and helps to increase the production of gastric enzymes and um, acids, so activating those parietal cells. Gastrin kind of gets things moving and churning and secreting. Speaking of secreting, secretin is the hormone that's secreted by the duodenum when the chyme arrives. Secretin is gonna increase the secretion of bile from the liver and the buffers from the pancreas. So buffers are gonna help increase the pH of the chyme, right? Remember the pH or the chyme comes over has a very low acidic pH. So buffers are gonna be secreted by the pancreas. Bile is gonna be secreted by the liver to help emulsify the fat. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, secretin also decreases gastric motility which makes sense because if the chyme is moving into the small intestine, we no longer need the stomach to be mixing it up, right? Remember, that's what gastrin did. Gastrin was getting the stomach secreting and moving. So when you hear your tummy rumbling, it's probably because gastrin is being secreted and there's nothing in there. So there's GIP, or gastric inhibitory peptide. This comes from the duodenum when fats and carbohydrates go into the small intestine. This is what makes us feel full. This is going to inhibit gastric activity, so activity in the stomach. This is when we say, okay, we're definitely full, we're satiated, we don't need to eat anymore. It's also going to increase the release of insulin from the pancreatic islet cells. Insulin is needed to absorb carbohydrates, absorb sugar, uh, glucose into our cells. So by having carbohydrates in the duodenum, um, that's basically signaling, hey, we, you know, we need some insulin over here, we have some carbohydrates, that type of thing. Secondary effects include stimulating the other duodenal glands to release something like uh, all of their, um, their, their other hormones, like the secretin, right? So GIP and secretin are kind of related to each other. It's also gonna help to stimulate the um, synthesis of lipids 
in the adipose tissue. So actually getting the lipids to go into the adipose tissue, it's also going to help increase glucose use by skeletal muscle. So this is a kind of mobilize um, your storage, you know, put things in storage type of hormone. CCK um, is another hormone that is released by the duodenum when chyme arrives. It's especially released when lipids and partially digested proteins are arriving. What CCK does is increase enzyme production and secretion in the pancreas. So this also causes the ejection of bile from the gallbladder and um, inhibits gastric activity. It could also reduce hunger um, that hungry sensation that's initiated by our central nervous system. So CCK is, again, turning off the stomach, putting the main focus on the chyme that's in the duodenum, getting the um, pancreas, pancreatic enzymes as well as the gallbladder um, secretions into the duodenum so that continuation of chemical digestion can occur. VIP, vasoactive intestinal peptide, is also from the duodenum. This is secreting um, or stimulating the secretion by the intestinal gland. So it's going to dilate the capillaries in the area, allowing them to absorb more nutrients, and it's going to inhibit the production of acid in the stomach. Again, we don't need the stomach. Turn it off now. Let's focus our attention on the intestine, right? So that's, that's kind of the function of this vasoactive intestinal peptide or VIP. So VIP is basically causing those capillaries to dilate, prepping them for nutrient absorption. Basically saying, all right, guys, we got a bunch of food, got, got a bunch of nutrients coming in. Let's go ahead and dilate so you can start sucking up all, these, all this good stuff. Right? So here's a graphic of all of these uh, hormones and where they're active. Gastrin, produced by those G cells in the stomach. Um, it's producing acid. It's continuing the production of acid by the uh, parietal cells and gastric motility, getting things moving and shaking in the stomach. Then you have GIP turning it off and stimulating the release of insulin, CCK and secretin, getting all of our other enzymes, buffers, bile released. VIP is going to dilate everything, get everything ready for nutrient absorption. So um, again, each of these slides it would be a good idea maybe to print them out individually, summarize them individually, so that you can make sure that you understand the big picture of all these enzymes. The other thing you could do is create your own graphic organizer, right? At the top, have intestinal hormones, um, and then boom, boom, boom. Each of them coming off, maybe one from the stomach, one from the small intestine, uh, or duodenum, really. And then stomach, you could have gastrin, and then small intestine, you could have GIP, and secretin and CCK and VIP. And then from there, you'd have the de um, definitions of each of them, examples of each of them, and draw arrows between them, how one influences the other. You can pause the video here, go back and review this section. We're gonna continue on with the coordination of digestive activities. Remember, everything is controlled centrally through hormones and the nervous system, as well as locally, right? So there's always three methods of control. There are um, three main phases of gastric secretion. The first phase is called the cephalic phase. This is when you start to think about food, right? When you see food or smell food. Imagine that we're, we're sitting in a lecture hall, or maybe you're you know, somewhere you know, in your house somewhere and you haven't ate in a while. Someone pops popcorn um, or uh, makes dinner, and you start to smell it, and you haven't ate in a while. So guess what? you're going to start to get hungry. It's happening to me right now as I'm even just talking about it. It's directed by your central nervous system. Your consciousness starts to say, well, wait, it has been a while since we ate. Oh, that smells good. I bet that would taste really good too. So it's basically prepping your digestive tract for the arrival of food. So the parasympathetic activation is going to kick in. Your salivary glands are going to start secreting. I have gum right now, but mine are, I'm salivating right now as well. Um, your gastric glands are going to start secreting the acid and pepsinogen, getting everything you know prepped and ready. Your stomach might even start to growl in preparation because of the gastrin increasing stomach motility. So um, you're going to again start secreting those gastric juices, and that this phase can last a few minutes unless you don't eat for a while. Um, it could last a little longer. So that's your cephalic phase. Then we go into our gastric phase. Our gastric phase is when the food actually arrives in the stomach. 
This is going to be caused by the actual stretching or distension of the stomach, the increase in um, pH of the stomach. You know, the stomach is typically a low pH, but if you're going to dump, you know, some food in it, that pH is going to rise a little bit. Or the presence of undigested material like proteins and peptides in the stomach. This is going to bring about more gastrin secretion, mixing and churning, right? Imagine that stomach really contracting all those three muscular layers of the muscularis externa, churning it up. All the gastric pits are secreting the HCL and the pepsinogen, which is being activated, turned to pepsin, and all this chemical digestion is occurring. This phase can last up to four hours. So the cephalic phase is just the site of food. The, these, these slides are a little bit of out, out of order. Sorry. The uh, gastric phase is when that food actually arrives. It's kind of strange. Uh, then we have the intestinal phase. This is the third phase. This is when the chyme begins to enter the duodenum. This is usually after several hours, three to four hours of mixing in the stomach. And now the pyloric sphincter is beginning to relax and spurt, remember that ketchup bottle, into the duodenum. Now, this is called the gastro enterogastric reflex. This is going to turn off gastrin, right? We don't need the stomach secretion. We don't need the stomach to move and churn anymore. Decreasing st um, gastric secretion, gastric motility. It's going to in increase the um, stimulation of the pyloric sphincter, getting it to spurt that chyme into the duodenum and getting that um, mucus production really up and running in the duodenum to protect those cells from the acidic pH. So there you see uh, kind of what's going on. Those stretch receptors in the duodenum are going to uh, turn on CCK, the release of CCK, GIP, VIP, secretin, all of those, um, and the uh, gastrin is going to be inhibited. So there are several reflexes involved in the digestion process. Um, there are central reflexes. These central reflexes are typically stimulated by the stretch receptors in the stomach as it fills. It's also going to help accelerate movements along the small intestine. So as you start to eat um, more and you have food already in your stomach, I should say chyme, in your small or large intestine, that food's going to be pushed along much quicker as you start to bring more food in, right? Accelerating the movements along. The gastroenteric reflex is going to stimulate your intestinal motility and secretion along the entire small intestine to get it to move through, as well as those brush border enzymes being secreted and all of your, your nutrients being absorbed. There's also a gastroileal reflex. This is going to trigger the opening of the ileocecal valve, allowing food chyme to pass from the small to the large intestine. So the gastroenteric reflex, stimulating the motility, ileal reflex, uh, gastroileal ref reflex, um, pushing that food into the large intestine. You can pause the video here, go back and review this section. Speaking of large intestine, let's talk about it. It's also known as the large bowel or bowel in general. Um, it's much shorter than our large, our small intestine, but it's larger in diameter, so it's up to three inches in diameter, about five feet long. Major functions here, instead of absorbing and digestion, digesting nutrients, here we're reabsorbing water. We're also compacting the undigestible or unabsorbed uh, contents into feces. Also absorbing important uh, vitamins here. Vitamins in the large intestine um, can be manufactured by bacterial cells. Um, and obviously we also store feces in our large intestine until we're ready to remove it from our body. So there's three segments involved in our large intestine, the cecum, the colon, and the rectum. So let's talk about the cecum. It's the pouch that's at the end of the ileum. So that ileocecal valve, the cecal is the cecum. Um, this is collecting and storing materials, begins this process of compaction as the undigestible material moves to the large intestine. The opening between the cecum and ileum is the ileocecal valve, as we mentioned already. The cecum, it also has the appendix attached to it. Sometimes it's called the vermiform appendix. It's the same thing. It's this very small lymphoid-like uh, organ. It functions as a filtering station. Appendicitis is the inflammation of the appendix. The colon is the next segment of our large intestine. It has a very large diameter, much thinner walls than our small intestine, and it is divided into four regions, the ascending, the transverse, the descending, and the sigmoid, which is the little curve to get 
that descending back to the middle of the body where the rectum is. So ascending and descending are retroperitoneal. They're actually attached to the abdominal wall. They're not in the peritoneal cavity. They're outside of it. The transvoice and sigmoid are in, um, kind of held in place by that mesocolon that we mentioned earlier. The ascending colon bends at what's called the right colic flexure. It's just the, the bend. Sometimes it's called the hepatic flexure because it's right by the liver. The transverse colon then crosses across the body from right to left right to left. Um, and it then makes a 90 degree turn downwards at the left colic flexure. The descending colon ends at the sigmoid flexure and the sigmoid colon kind of makes the shape of an S. It's about six inches long and that empties into the rectum. The rectum is the last six inches or so of our digestive tract. It's expandable for feces storage and the movement of fecal material into the rectum is what triggers us to say, oh, I think I need to go to the bathroom. So there are some other structures that are on our large intestines. We have these fatty appendices, which are little sacks of fat that kind of hang off the serosa of our colon. And obviously those are bigger on some of us and smaller on some of us. And notice they're called omental appendices, and, uh, kind of an homage to the greater omentum, right? A big fatty um, uh, mesentery. The tenny coli is the bands of smooth muscle that run along the ascending, transverse, and descending colon. It almost looks like a string. Um, they run on the outer surface deep to the serosa, and they correspond with the outer layer of muscularis externa on other parts of our digestive system. So this is kind of the, our the um, large intestines version of that longitudinal layer in the, in the um, muscularis externa. And then there's halstra. Halstra are the pouches. When you look at the large intestine on a model or in a picture, you're gonna see these pouches. The pouches are the halstra. Um, they produce the internal folding that you'll see mimicked on the inside of the intestinal, large intestinal lumen. It's created by the muscle tone of that tiny coli and it allows for the elongation and expansion of the colon. So here you can see those mental appendices, the tenny coli, the halstra. You can see the ileocecal valve and the cecum as it looks like a big old pocket there with the appendix hanging off of it, ascending colon, the right colic flexure, transverse colon, left colic flexure, descending colon, sigmoid flexure, sigmoid colon, all the way down to the rectum. Notice the rectum does not have a serosa either, just like the mouth. Um, there's no serosal lining. Something called a mass movement. Um, I, I, don't, I love the concept of a mass movement. I don't know. Maybe I just have a potty brain or something. But what a mass movement is, is that par powerful peristaltic contraction that's going to only happen a few times a day. And this is in response to the stretching in our stomach and in our duodenum. Remember we said that these gastroenteric reflexes, when you have stretching going on in the upper part, it's gonna cause the lower part to kind of push things through. And that's exactly what a mass movement is. This helps push everything in the transverse colon down to the descending colon, and then of course to the sigmoid and to the rectum. So this is, sometimes you'll get this feeling um, that you have to go to the bathroom after you eat. And that is why it's because all of this movement in the upper GI tract is triggering the movement in the lower GI tract. This is very uh, obvious in younger children and babies. Um, when you feed them, they tend to go to the bathroom. And, um, and you know, I, I know I can relate to that as a mother of young children. I'm sitting, you know, we're sitting at the table for dinner and what do my kids have to do? They have to go to the bathroom. I would love to eat dinner one day without having the white butts, but maybe that's too much information, or maybe you can relate. Either way, that's my life. You can, you know what, I think I'm going to pause this video here. It's going down the toilet. Get it? Um, pause this video here, stop share, and we are going to finish up in the next video.